Binky Smalls was onto something there. Mo money, mo problems. Uh, welcome to week one of our Lost Sermon Series. Before we dive in, um, wasn't worship incredible this morning? Would you guys give our team a round of applause? Also, uh, Noe, come out here real quick. Noe's graduating college this week, and <laughs> Noe is the first in his family to graduate college, and we just know God's going to use him in big ways. Thanks, Noe. Praise God. Ah, praise God. So this morning we're talking about money and materialism, and I think that many of us have a religious allergy whenever a pastor or a Christian leader starts to address the topic of money in the church. And we as a church recognize that. We too have seen Christians on TV uh, asking for credit card numbers and waiting till their multi-million dollar buildings are paid off and their Mercedes are blinged out and their house is all blinged out and they're blinged out. I want to be clear, this sermon series is not a manipulative way for you to give us more money, okay? That's not our heart at all. I drive a Mitsubishi, okay? Like, there's no Mercedes floating around prodigal church. Uh, we also know that there's almost no more personal thing to talk about than money. We could talk about sex. We could talk about unforgiveness. Then we start talking about money, you're like, whoa, 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 too far. <laughs> it's getting personal here. Uh, we know this. We realize that many of us are having a mini panic attack because we realize the day we chose to go to church, they're talking about money. Um, we know all these things and we're aware of that tension. But here's our heart. We strive to be a church that's authentic and honest and to address real life and real situations in real life. And the truth is, how could we not talk about money when it's the very thing that we go to sleep worried about or it's the very thing that we just fought with our spouse about the past several hours, weeks, or months. And so how could we not talk about it? Uh, how can we not talk about the thing that causes so much worry, stress, and anxiety in our lives? This, uh, this thing called money, this is a $20 bill. Uh, you can buy lunch with this, perhaps like two gallons of gas with this. Um, <laughs> Raise your hand if you would like this $20 bill. Okay, raise your hand. A lot of, okay, some of you spiritual people are like, he's onto something, he's gonna do something here. <laughs> it's, it's just a 20, okay? Uh, hold on real quick, okay? A lot of people, a lot of hands raised. I see that hand. Now, money can be hazardous to your health. Two researchers at the University of Louisville have decided and, and found that 13% of the coins and 42% of all paper money produce, uh, carry disease-carrying organisms. Anybody still want this 20? <laughs> There's more hands. Okay, that's weird. Um, you see, we hold up money to be the cure-all for everything. I wouldn't be stressed out if I just had this amount of money. I wouldn't be unhappy if my checking account had a few more zeros at the end. Billy Graham once said this, tell me what you think about money, and I'll tell you what you think about God. Wow. Tell me what you think about money, and I'll tell you what I think about God. I truly believe that money and the desire for money has become an idol for many of us, and we instead trust in that. We put on our money, we trust, you know, trust in God, right? In God, we trust. But really, it's in Benjamin that we trust. <laughs> and greed is something that we all struggle with, and as soon as somebody says, that you struggle with something, you immediately think of ways that you're not. As soon as someone says that you're not a certain way, you can recall something, you immediately go back to something that you did that proves that you're not like that. Guys, how many times has this happened if you're married? Some point in every marriage, and in multiple times in my own marriage, our wives will say something to us like, you just don't help around the house enough. And then what's the first thing you do as a husband? You tell the story about that one time you did something, right? Remember that time in 2014 when you came home and the dishwasher was empty? Who do you think did that? That was me. Don't help around the house, please. 2014, hello. <laughs> we immediately think of something that we did that's the exception to the rule. You can walk up to the meanest person in the world and go, do you realize that everybody thinks you're mean? 
and they would immediately think back about that one thing four years ago that they were so nice. And then they would define themselves by that. So it is with greed. Greed comes natural for us. Uh, you know who's selfish and greedy? My kids. Okay. Uh, there's a picture of Ivy and Dex. And uh, Ivy is 11 months old and Dex is four. And it, it's all about them, you know? Dex wants the same five songs every time we get in the car. And it's like, son, sometimes I don't want to hear, you know, Can't Stop the Feeling by Justin Timberlake. Sometimes I'm over it. It's a good jam, son, but let's move on to something else. And Ivy, all she knows is selfishness. Uh, middle of the night, she's not concerned about anybody else's sleep. She wants to be held. She wants, you know, she wants attention. She wants affection. She's not worried about anybody else. Kids want what they want. This is why we have to teach our kids to share. We have to teach them to do that. It doesn't come natural. Your kid's playing with a toy. Someone up tries to, you know, play with that toy too. No. Mine. Mine. Greedy. Greedy little guys. Now, I love my kids, okay? They're great. And it's a stage, right? Eventually, they'll become less selfish. Uh, the problem with greed, though, is that we can't see it in the mirror because we don't define it that way. When I say greedy, uh, a greedy person, we think of, like, that old miser who has, like, gold, like, in his room <laughs> and, like, multiple padlocks and just sits in his room and, like, stares at his bags of gold. That's not greed. Uh, we think of someone who uh, is just surrounded by jewelry or stacks of cash and just salivating. Nobody does that, okay? That's not greed. Greed is the person who has very little, who has a medium amount, or who has a lot, but they assume that it all belongs to them, for them. That's what Jesus called greed. You know where greed leads? Leads to worry, discontentment. We want to live a life of generosity, and that's the cure for greed. Jesus says this in Luke 12. Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in abundance of possessions. He says be on your guard. It's as if he, Jesus is saying that greed is aggressive. Be on your guard. Be prepared. Greed is a sneaky little sin because we don't know we're doing it. If, uh, we know about stealing. Like it, he doesn't say be on your guard about stealing. Uh, if, if we're stealing, we know we're doing it. But with greed, he says, be on guard. Be ready. You may not know. It, it's the most normal sin, and therefore it might be the most dangerous sin. In my 15 years of full-time ministry, no one has ever come up to me and said, man, I really struggle with greed. It's never happened. Because we all struggle with it. The cure for greed is not more Bible studies. The cure for greed is not more church the cure for greed is generosity. And as Christians, we're about giving, not greed. Acts 20 says this, In everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak, remembering the words of the Lord Jesus himself. It is more blessed to give than to receive. This is a really cool verse for a few reasons. Paul here is quoting Jesus, right? He says, as our Lord Jesus has said, it's better to give and than to receive. But what's interesting about it is that if you were to search the words of Jesus in the Bible you will not find this passage. In all the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you can search them high and low, look for the red letters where Jesus says it is more blessed to give to than to receive, and you will not find them. Paul is quoting Jesus, but he's not quoting the words of Jesus from the Gospels. What's that mean? It means that this phrase, it's more blessed to give than to receive, was spoken so many times by Jesus that it just became commonplace and common knowledge that that was something that he said. They didn't need to write it down in the Gospels. Everybody knew that's Jesus. It's more blessed to give than to receive. And he's not talking about Christmas presents, right? That's what we normally associate this with. It's more blessed to give to, than to receive. And so even people who are not even Christians like know that and really believe that's true. And it is true. It's just not what Jesus is talking about. He's talking about our income. Using it to bless people, not to acquire more for ourselves. 2 Corinthians 9, 7 says this, Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. The word cheerful here is the, the Greek word hilaros. Hilaros. It's where we get the word hilarious. Ah, where we get the word hilarious. God loves a hilarious giver. 
I don't have a point to that. It's just I want to show off my seminary education. That's what it's worth right there, okay? It's hilarious. Let's call a spade a spade. Our giving is very often sporadic, spontaneous, and sparing. Sporadic, we do it, but we do it at, at, at random. Spontaneous, homeless guy on Blackstone. Yep, I should, I should. Uh, at a charity event, everybody else seems to be giving. This is a good cause. I should write a check. Sparing, we don't really let, us, let it affect our lifestyle. For many of us, this is what generosity looks like. And it's wonderful, no matter how you give, no matter how much or how little, it is always good to give. But it, giving sporadically or spontaneously or sparingly isn't going to make us generous people. So this morning, we're going to see how Jesus moves us from the three S's, uh, sporadic, spontaneous, sparing, to the three P's, priority, percentage, and plan. Priority, percentage, and plan. So first priority. Giving should be the very first thing we do when we get our paycheck. Generous people give it before they consume it. This is key. Uh, it isn't just about giving more. The key to generosity is reordering and reprioritizing our finances so that what was left, if I have any, I'll give, that goes first. The principle is you give the first and the rest is blessed. And here's the blessing, that you are freed from the hold that money has on you. When you give, you're blessed. I'm not a health and wealth gospel preacher. Uh, there are times when God supernaturally intervenes in our circumstances where we give sacrificially and then all of a sudden we get a check or something sells or our business gets an increase. Sometimes that happens and that's great and good, but not all the time. You might give sacrificially and at the end, you still might be broke, okay? It doesn't always work out like supernatural provision. It's okay, we give no matter what, whether there's a supernatural blessing that, that gives us more finances or if there isn't. You give sacrificially, you still might be broke. The blessing is the freedom from the desire for more and advancing the kingdom of God, helping others. Money has us all by the neck. It chokes us. We lose sleep over it. And God has only given us one cure for the stranglehold that money has on our lives, giving it away. There's no other way. You can't study the Bible enough. You can't go to church enough. You can't help enough people cross the street. You can't give enough. The, the only way, the only way to get rid of our desire for more is to actually loosen our grip and give it away. And this principle of doing it first is woven throughout Scripture. Exodus 23 says this, As you harvest your crops, bring the very best of the first harvest to the Lord. God says when you have an animal, and then that animal has another an animal, the first needs to be sacrificed. That took faith. That took faith. Because you don't know if it's going to happen again, right? You don't know if that, 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 that fertile myrtle cow is going to continue to have more cows. He doesn't say, when you have an animal, wait till it has 10 animals and then give one. No, he says, when it has one, the first one, that's the one you give. God didn't say wait. Many of us will say, well, I'll start tithing when I'm out of my current circumstances. And I just want to let you guys know, there's zero good time to start tithing. It's never convenient. It is never convenient. And the second is percentage. And the Bible gives us a percentage to help us. Leviticus says, a tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. It's holy to the Lord. Tithing is 10% of your income to the kingdom of God to the purposes of God. 10% levels the playing field so that everybody can give, whether you're rich, whether you're poor. It, 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 it's, an, it's a starting percentage, and it's hard. And if you can't do 10%, that's okay. Try and figure out, start at three, or, or go to seven, and then work your way to 10. Three and seven, those are good Bible numbers. Well, so is 40, but, you know, <laughs> three and seven will be just fine. But pick a percentage, and eventually you can work your way towards giving more. But it's not just the 10%, it's the first 10%. It takes first, it takes faith to give away the first 10% and then pay the bills with this, what's left. God should always be first. Let's get really practical. Let's say you have a business. I hire you, you have an ironing business. I hire you 
to come in and do all of my ironing. I hate ironing. Hate it. So first you get, you pull out the board, and then you pull out the iron, and like, you know you left water in it last time you ironed, but now it's empty. Where did that water go? I don't know. So you, then you have to go fill it in with water, and then you pull out your clothes to get ironed, and you're like, how did it get so wrinkly? Like, for me, I think Satan goes into my closet in the middle of the night and just goes, hmm. <laughs> that's going to really fire John up. And it does. So I hate ironing. So I hire you to do uh, all my ironing, okay? You have an ironing business. And after all the equipment, all the products, everything is bought, your profit is $100. I hand you 10 $10 bills, okay? $100. How much of that is the tithe? 10, right? 10. You guys are good at math. Um, which of the 10, 10, $10 bills is the tithe? First, first. How do you know which one's first? It's the first one that leaves your hand. It's the first you spend. So you get home, you got your $100, your $10, 10, $10 bills, and then you pay off that bill goes there, uh, this one goes there, this one goes there. And at the end of the line, you might not have enough for generosity towards God. Uh, so, or if you do, you pay $10 here, $10 here, $10. Okay, I got at least 15 left, 10 goes to God. That might be 10%, but I don't know if it's a tithe. It's about being first. What releases the blessing is not the amount, but the order. Every time you get paid, it's a test what your priorities are with money. The principle in Exodus is when you give to God, he blesses. Don't give first your money to the mortgage company. They don't have the power to bless you. God does. Now, it's a principle. There's nothing legalistic about this, okay? If I get my paycheck and I'm ready to write a tithe to the church or to whatever organization it is, and at the same time, Sarah has her card, which is the same bank account, and she's at the store. And then she makes it to the cashier before I send my check to the church. Thanks, babe. Now, now we're cursed. We miss our blessing because you wanted to buy Honey Nut Cheerios. You know, like, no, it's a principle, not a law. And I want to say this, too. I'm so grateful for the generous people in our church. We're so blessed. Thank you for so much for the incredible generosity that you show here at our church. And in the back of the bulletin, you'll find some of the areas that, where some of that money is going. Uh, we'll talk more about this next week, but um, to missions work in southeastern Africa, building an elementary school for children who have to walk three to four miles every day to go to school. Um, and we're building an elementary school in the village where they have to walk a few houses down. Uh, your dollars, the money you give, goes towards that. You'll hear more about that next week. We're so blessed. We don't pass an offering. When I tell other pastors we don't pass an offering, they go, well, huh? Uh, I go, yeah, like the people just, they just give. <laughs> like there's, bo there's boxes out back and they can give online, but we don't really ever talk about it. This is the first time we've talked about money from the stage in our nine months of being a church. Uh, and, and we're fine. <laughs> Uh, now, there are some pastors in, uh, and churches who interpret these passages about tithing to say that it doesn't count unless it goes to the local church. I am not one of those pastors. You don't have to give to the prodigal church. Give to some kids in need. Give to some family in your neighborhood. Give to, to Compassion International or World Vision. Adopt some kids in a far country. Give to the rescue mission. Find something you believe in that advances kingdom purposes and give there. It doesn't have to be to us. If you never give a cent to prodigal church, that doesn't change your standing within the church. First of all, I won't know. Secondly, if you give lots of money to prodigal church, it also doesn't affect your standing in our church. Okay? You know, there's no special privileges if you give this amount at prodigal as opposed to this amount. But give 10%. Give to what you believe in. Give to what will outlive you. It doesn't have to be prodigal. What you keep is all you have. What you give, God can multiply. Hattie Mae Wyatt, a six-year-old girl living near Grace Baptist Church in Pennsylvania, said the Sunday school that she went to was so crowded. 
And the, Russell H. Conwell, the minister, told her one day that one day they'd have enough money to have a building to build a bigger Sunday school. She said, well, I hope you do. I'm scared to go in there sometimes. It's so crowded. And he says, well, when we get the money, we'll, we'll be able to do that. Two years later, in 1886, Hattie May died. After the funeral, Hattie's mother gave the minister a little bag that they found under their daughter's pillow containing 57 cents and change that she had saved up. Alongside it was a note in her writing. It says, to help build a bigger Sunday school so that more children can go. The minister changed all that money into pennies and offered each one of those pennies for sale. He got $250 and 54 cents. And that $250 was itself changed into pennies and sold by the new formed uh, Wyatt Might Society. In this way, her 57 cents kept on multiplying. 26, late, 26 years later, in a talk entitled The History of the 57 Cents, the minister explained the results of this donation. A church membership of over 5,600, a hospital where tens of thousands of people had been treated, 80,000 young people had gone through university, 2,000 people going to preach the gospel. All this happened because of Hattie Mae Wyatt invested 57 cents. What you keep is all you have. What you give, God can multiply. Give to the purposes of God. Give to something you believe in. Give to something bigger than yourself. And lastly, planned. Plan. You got to have a plan. Don't be like the husband who forgot his anniversary altogether. The anniversary came and went, didn't do anything. And the wife gets upset, obviously, talks to him at night in a very stern, intense fellowship way. And she says, the only way you can make this up is that if tomorrow morning there's something in the driveway that goes at zero to 200 in under six seconds. <laughs> and he's like, oh, oh, man. Next morning, she wakes up. He's gone already to work. And she looks out in the driveway, and there's a little gift box. So she runs out there, and she opens it up, but it wasn't what she expected. It was a bathroom scale. Now, <laughs> now she was, seems like a bad gift, but in reality, she got exactly what she asked for, something that goes zero to 200 in under six seconds. The husband's funeral was scheduled the next day. <laughs> got to have a plan. Got to have a plan. I'm going to invite the worship band up, and we'll close with this. Just imagine for a second, you have a checking account, and you can't spend it. It's yours, but it's not yours. It's yours to manage, but you don't possess it. You can't do anything to benefit you, but you've got a massive checking account. All you can do is give the money away. You don't have to give it away immediately. You have one year to do it. Wouldn't that be fun? Like a kid in your neighborhood's like raising money to go to camp, and you just like write a check for it. Uh, there's an event at school, and uh, it costs $800 that they're trying to raise. You write a check for $900. And the kids go up to you, and you're like, you must be rich. And you're like, no. I just woke up someday, and an angel said I had this massive amount of money, and I couldn't spend it on myself, so uh, I'm just spending it on other people. I'm grateful. If you live that way, if you got that blessing to just spend it on other people, you'd be so grateful. You wouldn't be regretful, and you wouldn't be possessive. I'm telling you, the experience of joy that you would have in giving that all away is greater than if you got to keep the money for yourself. So here's my question. Why not just do that going forward? We're not owners of our possessions. We're managers. It's all God's. So let's be generous. We often ask God this question, right? When we don't have enough, and every one of us has been there, where it's like, I don't know if we're going to make it this month. And we're like, God, why? Why? Because we look at other people, and they, they're making more. They seem to have more. Their house is bigger. Their kids are better dressed. We look at all these things, and we go, why, God? Why not me? We ask God why when we don't have enough, but we don't ask God why when we do have enough. Right? We don't ask what's your purpose in this abundance because we've all had seasons like that too, right? Where 
there's less worry. We seem to be doing okay financially. We're on stable ground. We don't ask God then, what's your purpose in this abundance? What if the purpose in the abundance that we might have is not so that you'll have less worry about money? What if the purpose is something greater? What if God wants to use it to bless somebody else? What if it's that person who got their house broken into in your neighborhood and you can now help them? What is that someone who their car broke down and now it costs $600 to fix a radiator? What if you were to be able to bless them because of that? We need to move from sparing, sporadic, and spontaneous to priority, to percentage, to plan. And here's the thing, it'll radically transform you. I truly believe that the only way to get rid of this hold that money has on us, our desire to keep what we have and to get more, the only way, the only cure written into the heart of humanity is to release it. Give it to something bigger than yourself. Give it to something you believe in. Give it to people who need it. That's God's heart. God, I pray in Jesus' name that for those in this place who are really struggling financially, they've been the why God, why? I pray in Jesus' name, God, that you would give them the peace that transcends understanding. Someone sent me this in text this week that you said, Jesus, my peace I give to you. So God, would you give us your peace? And God, for those who are in that season of abundance, that it wouldn't be just to lower our worry or our anxiety about money and having enough. God, that you would share your purposes for that abundance. I pray that we continue to be just a generous church, a church that makes a difference in our city, a church that makes a difference in our world, a church that makes a difference for the poor and the needy. God, we, we love you. We're so grateful for your love for us and that you showed us what generosity is in the cross. God, that you didn't die for us because you were mad at us, because you had to solve a heavenly equation. You died because you were madly in love with us. And so, Jesus, we pray that, that we would go and do likewise, that we would live sacrificially in every aspect of our lives, that we would love our spouses with sacrificial love, that we would love our neighbors and our bosses and our coworkers and our enemies with the sacrificial love that you show us on the cross. Forgiving our enemies with your last dying breath. God, we pray that for that kind of radical love to transform us, to transform our view of money and wealth, and that we live differently because of you. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand as we sing together this last song that deals with the faithfulness of God? No matter what season you might be in, whether it's a season of abundance or a season of, of not enough and a season of why, God's never left you. He's never failed you. Let's sing this together. Your